All right, good evening and welcome to the shop here in beautiful downtown Canterbury, New Hampshire. Tonight we have a little fun. I'm going to do a, some exploration into some freeform wall art. I have had these pieces, these curved laminated pieces for some time. They were cutoffs from our epic um, <laughs> lily pad table adventure. It's a coffee table, but there are three tiers of, of oval shaped discs and they were at slightly different levels and we used um, Carpathian right. Elm, which was quite difficult to work with, but <laughs> wow, the payoff you was amazing. Figured out, you figured it out. Yeah. yeah, that's in our second series. I actually put a link to the whole playlist in the description. There's 13, I believe, uh, sessions that you made that happen. And right. Well, one of the enjoyable aspects of building that coffee table was once we got the top done and the legs shaped and it needed some kind of stretchers. And so we created this just freeform curve, these uh, reverse curves that looked almost like fish swimming on beneath the lily pads. And I created these forms and here's actually the forms from the course. The way these work is they imagine. sandwich the laminations so you have the positive and negative forms and then it only takes a few clamps because this is three uh, layers. It's two layers of, of Baltic birch ply with a half inch layer of MDF in between. So it gets you a nice, thick, easy to use form. And it was pretty cheap because that, that plywood wasn't very much when I got it at the time. Who knows what it is now? But it was um, made to be 916 thick, these stretchers. And I used material actually 16th of an inch mahogany, not poplar. This is, but this is special thickness, 16th of an inch poplar. And you can get this kind of thing from uh, veneer dealers. This particular piece came from Certainly Wood. We will add a link uh, in the description, but look under special thicknesses, the section of their veneers, and you'll find not just poplar, but some others. And it's very handy in times when you want to build your own laminations out of solid wood. And uh, it's without sawing it and sanding it and trying to prep it yourself. The only thing is you don't get the luxury of the consecutive layers. Like if you resaw it yourself, you can mark the layers and just keep them sequential, mark them on the end and then return them to the same orientation they were in. And when you bend or laminate a curve, after the glue hardens and all and you shape it, the glue lines melt away and you're left with what appears to be solid wood because the glue lines are very difficult to see, especially in darker wood. So you have that going for you when you make your own, but you have to pay the price of the time involved in resawing, sanding, and all that. This is a great option if you need thicker, special thickness materials. It's not just 16th of an inch, but they have 10th of an inch sometimes and really handy to buy it in that way. Now, I'm not gonna go through the whole process but I would just chunk this to a rough length here and then rip it. You can actually join it and then rip it into strips of the certain width. And I would need nine of them to make my 916 stretcher for this one. I'm gonna just set this out of the way. For that coffee table, we had uh, mahogany stretchers. So I used mahogany material. And after I put all the layers in the form and then clamp the form up on the layers. When we popped open the, the jig or the bending form, we had these curved stretchers. Now this is just one of them. We actually had three different types of sine curves basically, or you can think of it as a sima curve like that reverse thing you see a lot in 18th century furniture. See, you can barely see the lines on this, right? Even though these are not, sequential, but when this was shaped and then stained and it got darker, it was hard to see that there are nine layers there. 
It just looks like the grain, doesn't it? And this side shows the urea formaldehyde glue that I used that squeezed out on one side. I didn't touch that yet. Now, when I glue this up, it was wider. Um, it was probably, it was close to two inches wide. So I've already ripped it for demonstration purposes, but I do want to show you one little rip. Now we used a pretty good height. I think it ended up being like an inch and a half high or, or uh, for the stretchers on that coffee table. But I had an extra from doing a demo. And you know, I just got to thinking, and I had some cutoffs from the coffee table too. I decided I would try to make some kind of, it's wall art. They seemed like they would look cool, like these flowing waves or something. So let's do it. I mean, all the great ideas of history started with someone just giving it a shot, never caring, you know? That's part of the risk. And like some famous guy said, you, you either win or you learn, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna find out. All right, so here we go. All right, now to, to uh, rip this up, pretty tricky, right? But I usually, I just jointed one edge when it was wider on the joiner. So it, it does help to have a wider joiner, but if I didn't, I would take the fence off and started it and just kind of pass it right over. I have a 12 inch wide joiner, but I would have, I've done it on eight inch joiners too, but you just kind of follow the curve, keeping as much as possible on both tables as you go across. So you get it relatively true. So then I come over to the bandsaw and I've already set it up with um, a taller resaw type fence. I talked about this once in a, in a resawing video, if you want to see it, but this is a chutz over seven inches wide which makes it nice to give you some bearing on wider stock that you're resawing, but it also came in real handy for this because I wanted to rip this into quarter inch strips and it's pretty tough to do without a taller fence. Um, now I set the fence actually a little heavier because I, I wanted to run it through the thickness sander to get it to the actual quarter. So I still have the fence set up from when I had it, but I'll just show you how I ripped it. And then we'll go to the pieces that we've already sanded. So you've got to find out which way is the most conducive to getting a good cut. So if I run it through, I've got to join to this edge. If I run it through this way, I'm usually trying to rotate it to keep it on the table while I'm going through. But then I would come here and I would have this this is the, the higher of the two loops there. This one, this side is a little lower of a curve. So I think I'll finish with that one and I'll start with this one where I can just kind of, I'm not on the fence, but I'm just gonna kind of rotate it down and then I can keep this on the fence, All right? So here we go. So there you go. I mean, that's pretty close and it's a touch over a quarter, a couple passes on the sander and I would have my pieces, but I've only got enough there to get really one more. Um, so that's what you get. I have, I just want to show you another curve that I'll introduce in a little while, but these are cutoffs from a, a table. Like I had this, it was like a uh, side table for a living room and had laminated these really interesting staves that went around the perimeter. I think there was probably 16 of them. 
So they all came together and they were narrower kind of at the waist. And, and I got a, um, a blacksmith to custom make a, a ring, like an iron hammered ring around the middle, like it was cinching together the wood. So you can imagine these pieces like together like that with all coming together at the waist. And then they came down and landed on a platform base that was, well, it was circular. And, uh, and then it had an interesting top to it. But this, these are the cutoffs because where those came together, they were wider out at the bottom, maybe about three inches. And I sawed them, you know, kind of like an hourglass, but with a curve, each one of them on the bandsaw, just like I showed you. So I came in like that. These are the cutoffs from making that curve cut. So you can kind of see you know, how it was initially shaped. These were hard to get rid of, too. Because <laughs> a lot of work went into making these. You know, you've got your laminated white oak backing, and the face is wingy. Not just any wingy, though. It's, it's 16th inch thick. I made this myself. I had to resaw it and then run it through the sander. And then I ran it on the the uh, wire brush to give it texture. So I ended up blackening or ebonizing the sides of all of them. So you couldn't really see in there well. It just appeared to be uh, wengi as well. I wish I, I, I looked for the photo. I didn't have it on the iPad, so I don't have it to show you, but I will show you sometime. So here I've got three pieces. And these are all the same. On that lily pad table, I had three different shapes for the stretchers. So for this one, I've got just these three. Now, I like this kind of feeling of having them overlap and interlock like this and kind of move like that. Like you could just do something very, you know, rhythmic and continuous like that, right? Or... I thought, rather than being so symmetrical, if we flip this around, so this is a little softer curve here. This is the stronger curve, and here's the stronger curve. Now I can have these two come together, and I have kind of an interesting little swoosh going on there. And so let's say I connected them like that, and I said, okay, that's a good beginning. I kind of like that. This is totally up to you, you know. Um, and then... We want to see, okay, this one has a strong curve. We want to kind of lay this over and have, I just like this idea of flowing and it's like flowing outward like waves or that would be interesting just visually to see carry on the wall. You could even do something uh, kind of staircasey like this. Is that right? You know, it could kind of go downhill like that, more so. You know, so something slanted or sloped. But it's, it's totally up to you. Now, you could have more laminations and all that. This, it's really totally wide open to how you want to handle this. So let me get back to where I was. I'm going to go with something like this. I, like, I just like the way this looks. You know, rather than have loose ends like that, which you could do, I'm going to just go with these two being pretty close. And then this one is going to come in and interlock. So let's say, let's say it's going to go, I'm going to go under this one. Okay, so check this out. I kind of like the way this relates. You know, you've got these curves and then this one breaks into both and then goes beyond. All right, so let's just say that's what we're gonna do. Now we have to create the joinery for them to connect. So they're just gonna be lap joints. And once I've got it to where I want, I'm gonna tape it to hold it in position. So as I mark the joints, I'm not, everything's not slipping around. I don't have to tape every joint. I just wanna hold it from slipping. And now I'm going to come in with my scalpel and make some cuts. 
So I won't do main joints here. I just want to show making one joint, basically. So I'd make a knife cut on that side and then a knife cut over here. Just mark right along the material. I do the same right here. I've got this little curve coming in here. Because these are all going to kind of lay flat for now. And at the end, once they're interlocked, then you can shape the, um, the surfaces if you want to shape them outside of, you know, get away from the flat. I'm just going to put pencil lines so I could finish this later. This would be normally a knife line, but I'll just put these on so I know where I am later. You know, sometimes you see these abstract things, you know, in um, office buildings and whatever. And I'm sure you've had the experience where you've seen a piece of art and said, what in the world? Or I could do that. What was anyone thinking when they made that thing? You know, like it just, someone just really had some imaginative action there and made it happen, right? So this, this has great potential, I think, for somebody to emerge from this group and, you know, really get on the map. <laughs> I got to mark where this piece is overlapping because this is a two-part process. You have to do the front and then you do the back, but... I'll just get, um, I'm just going to get one joint done and you'll know exactly how the rest go. Okay. Now, before I take it apart, I do want to mark the orientation here. Are you here. half lapping this? Yeah. I'm going to half lap them. So I'll just say this is one, two, and three. Now, it's a good idea when you get the complexity of joints like that to uh, take a picture of it right now because you're going to be hard pressed, even though you put some little marks there to find out exactly how you had it laid out initially once you uh, have it. So I'm going to get a picture before <laughs> I lose it. Rod just gave you that. He just said, take a picture. Yeah, well, you look like you were going to ask a question. No? Um, I think it's Lupe okay. is asking, how does one get that jig? And I think she's talking about that bendable one, which is true. How do you? This? Yeah, I think that's the one. Is that a jig? Would you call that a jig? Yeah, all I did was I initially made the curve. I had a drawing, and so I was able to orient where the legs were in space on the drawing, and then I made some curves using sticks and I bent and fared these arches. Then from the, uh, from the curve on the paper, I slid under a piece of quarter inch MDF and perforated um, on my curve uh, with a stippling all. And then I came back with the bending uh, rods and fared, recreated the curve on the MDF. So then I cleaned up that initial quarter inch MDF, and that was my template. So once I had that, I tacked it to this half inch MDF that you see in the core there, and first just made a pen line, and then um, bandsawed to the pen line, and, and then flush routed that center piece to my quarter inch template. So now I had a, the center piece was done. And then I took, the Baltic birch, both sides of that form, and went ahead and made a um, bandsaw, those heavy to line, and you could put glue or, and then just tack them to both sides of that center, but left them overhanging because they were just bandsawed. Then with the flush cut bearing, 
I could flush cut with the bearing riding on the center that half and then I just flipped it over and flush cut the other half. So now I had a perfect curvature there. Now to get the, um, the uh, negative of that curve, I, had, I just used a series of spacers in order to give you your 9 16 you know, like cutters with bearings. So using that initial template, I tacked it to a table and plunge routed and made another perfect spaced away by 9 16 the other side of that. And then I just had the secondary template, which I ran through the exact same process to make that match up. I hope that explains it. All right, so once I've got this set up here, now I'm ready to make the joints. So <coughs> I just marked these right in the middle. So I'm only able to knife what I can see where I'm overlapping. So the first thing I would do is take them apart and now I can I can clean that one up and that one up because they're facing down. And then I'll come back. That's why I made, let's see, the pencil lines on the other ones to show me where to orient it. And then you can knife the other side. But let's, let me just show you this. For knifing this, I'm, I'm going to make a little, carry a little cut line. The router bit's going to be spinning this way. So it could tear out there. But if I just make a little cut line, just bring it over. I'm only going half the thickness, so I only have to go down like an eighth of an inch there. And then I would do the same over here. Okay, once I got that, I'm gonna just clamp it to the bench right like this. Now, whatever thickness it is, I while I was running that through the sander or ripping it, I ran a couple additional pieces of pine and ran it so that now I have these two little skis which are the exact same thickness so I can come over the top with my router and it's going to be pressing down just the exact tolerance there. Now I already set my plunge router to half the thickness of the material, about an eighth of an inch, and so that can be adjusted on the second pass anyway if it's slightly off in order to be flush. I'm going to just stay slightly away from the knife line when I make this cut. You can see in there. I can stay just off the knife line. It's almost straight right across here, so I'm just going to use a straight chisel and just set it right in the knife line and just push down gently. You only got an eighth of an inch, so you don't, I don't really like using a mallet on this because I wouldn't want to break through it. This isn't super thick. And if you leave just a little bit, you won't have to push too hard to get a nice. Nice job of it. And then you can come in the other way. Clean it out nicely. So you're just making a lap joint, but across curved pieces. Just kind of random. There we've got that one. And then I would do that to another one as well. Let's take this out. I'm not going to do, I'll just do one joint so we can see it. But if we put these back together, let's see if I can. This is the one that interlocked. So these two came together like this. This came in like this, obviously. This was something like that. And so this came up. Once you do all the one side, you can kind of press those in. 
and they hold where you want them. I'm going to just put tape on. What do you think about putting mirror in this? Um, if you wanted to make a groove on the side for adding a mirror, would yeah, the piece you could. I would just make it a little thicker. Of course, you'd have to. You could do something very funky. I mean, this is this is like a, a beautiful free form. I mean, you could get to the point where maybe you could saw this out of solid, but you you're going to run into short grain and all. It's kind of elegant to have it laminated with certain woods. But yeah, it would be. That's exactly, that's a great idea. Rather than just wall art, you'd have something useful. Of course, you'd have all these sticks to look through. Let's just tape this one. That'll hold it long enough. So normally you'd do all those facing up, and you'd be able to press it in halfway, and it'd have some kind of lock, and then you'd be able to flip it over and everything would stay where you want it. So now the obvious locations underneath are there. So you could come in again. You're going to knife now the, the opposite side of all the joints because now you're just dealing with the opposite. But they're all already let in halfway from the other side. So makes it really easy to position everything. And then you do that all over and then take the whole thing apart again. This time I'm going to just have to get it off here. Okay, and now we have our location right here. And we're going to go ahead and hit that one and see if it fits. It should fit. It's not, this is not a rocket science, but having a nice straight cutter um, and setting the depth will help you and then make your little stop cuts so you don't get the blowout there on the sides you could do this with a square a little square and square it down you can go right across because it's overlapping anyway all right and then we get here and we're ready to go Okay, go ahead and get these. If you've got some of them had small curves, so I use this very flat, it's just a number two sweep. It's almost flat, but it comes in handy when you have a subtle curve. But this side actually does have a little curve to it, so I'm going to use this. I miss having the light of the camera lady shining on things, illuminating my path. <laughs> Hmm. Does the battery just conk out? It shouldn't. Okay, so there you go. We've got that cleaned out. Now let's just see how that joint fits. You do all in series, so it goes pretty quickly. All right, so this was number two. Let's get these back over. They're still kind of together there. So it kind of went in here like this. So it'll be hard to get totally down because the others aren't done. But try to get that out of the way.
So there we are. We're kind of we're just a little above flush. I could set the I check the joint. Maybe I didn't clean it out totally, or I could adjust the plunger out of slightly down on the second one all around. All right. So there you go. That's, That's great. our look. Now I did make one earlier that I the the three different shaped ones and I went through the same process and they are fully cut so let's see if we can put these together um, there's really only one way they can go right yeah so these two let's see yeah this goes like this okay so this one goes here. I did a similar pattern. I'm not all the way done with it, but it didn't work out exactly the same. So I've got this kind of action going here. Mm. And then okay. this one, see how this is a much longer, flatter curve. I thought that would be nice, like carrying off into the distance. This one curve, this is the one we were just working with. Then I had a smaller curve and then a longer, flatter. So those were the three from the other one. So you could make different shapes and then interlock them. So this comes in here and then down here we interlock there. So we end up with this nice kind of wavy action. Let me s can you see it from, you may want to get over behind me. Here, right over to my left. So if I put it like that so it kind of looks like waves, right? So I started playing around with my other hidden jewels upstairs. <laughs> and I thought, man, let me see if I can have something here. And you know, I got to thinking, this would make something interesting maybe if I put these together. So these are all the same direction, the same side that I cut them off of. So I have, it's flat on this side and raised up here. And it's still bandsawing. So I would probably s s uh, spoke shave these and then maybe give them a little radius or something. If you can see that. But that's the white oak and then the wenge. So what I kind of like is when I put it here like this, like let's say I came in and I just, I would just cut this so that it butted up against the bottom there. I trimmed that off. And then I would put a second one. Let me put it over here like this. This is a little like the picture you'll see now. I bring a second one in, and I will actually uh, overlap this one so I can get, I'd slip it underneath so I can get a knife line. And this one would be overlapped to there or be butted up against that one and then this third one would come in this way and butt up to that one almost like a curve you could think of it as a wave breaking and then the flow going out this way so anyway I would probably go further with these and just give them a little doming you know and sand them you could even have it look like this one's running under that one give it a little carve downward and radius the one on top much like we've done we did the woven trivet you could do something like that where these interlock and then these would be nested and this would be cleaned up too and all this would have to be glued together and then decide what the best method i probably put some type of keyhole hook behind one of these or Somehow you'd have to figure a way that it's going to attach and stay on the wall. But it's, it's simply, this is just like a contemporary piece of wall art using wooden forms. You can spice it up by the variety of woods. I really like the way the mahogany, and I know this will finish beautifully. It'll have that beautiful mahogany look. And then these radiating pieces, I'm going to leave those, the golden, when that gets a nice kind of shellac on there, it'll have a beautiful golden color. And then the inside surface almost looks like it enhances the idea of shadow because of the wenge and the texture in there. It's just a beautiful, interesting look. So I just want you to think about that for the possibilities of what 
the way you can combine wood if you want to do some kind of wall art like this. And as you can see, it's almost made from found materials. So you don't even have to plan it that much. You just have to make some curves and then start seeing where it takes you. And that's mm -hmm. what it's all about, is to just have some fun in the shop and get creative and make something beautiful that's a part of you that you can pass on to your families, an expression of the best kind of love. <laughs> so thanks again for being with us here on in the shop in beautiful Canterbury. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time.